by the end of the 19th century, mathematicians became able to study not only curved lines and surfaces, but also more general objects in geometry called smooth manifolds, a kind of spaces that look flat if you zoom in close enough, and they have no sharp corners so that you can slide on them continuously. A map between two smooth manifolds whose inverse is also smooth is called diffeomorphism. The low dimensions, like lines and surfaces, any two smooth versions of the same shape turn out to be diffeomorphic. So there is actually only one differential structure. Although, in principle, one could imagine non-equivalent ones. For example, two graphs on the screen. Let's call them A and B. More technically, they are called atlases. If you transform A into B, and then from B back into A, the resulting map is the cube root of X, which is not smooth at zero. So A and B define non-equivalent differential structures on the same manifold, which is the real line. But they can still be diffeomorphic, and I'll leave this to you as an exercise. In higher dimensions, Something strange happens. This was first discovered in 1956 as a byproduct of studying the Poincaré problem. Leon John Milner shocked the math community by constructing seven dimensional spaces that have the same topological type as the ordinary seven dimensional sphere, but not diffeomorphic to the standard seven sphere. These strange objects are now called exotic spheres, and the discovery earned John Milner the Fields Medal. It provided a counterexample to the smooth Penkai conjecture, sparked a revolution in differential geometry. In mathematics, there is a very useful structure called fire bundle. It's a way of viewing a space as a total object viewed from a simple piece called fiber and gluing the fibers together along a base space according to a chosen structure group. For example, both the cylinder and the mobile strip can be seen as the fire bundle with the base the circle and the fiber the real line with the structure group GL1. Spheres themselves often appear this way. A classical example is the hub fibration, where the hyperspace can be composite into circles sitting over two spheres like a bundle of circles wrapping around a sphere. The usual semi sphere can be seen as an example of a hyperfibration, where it's like hairbrush with three dimensional hyperspheres as the bristles and four sphere as the barrel. Think of the three sphere as the set of unit quaternions, then the semi sphere can be described as all pairs of these quaternions with total null one. More generally, for each pair of integers h and j, we have m of h and j, the total space of fiber bundles with fiber s3 and base s4. Constructed by gluing together two copies of 7 dimension hand body f3 cross d4 along their common boundary f3 cross f3. The glue map uses the quaternion multiplication, twisting the fibers by the pairs of integers h and j, which we will show them later in the simulation. This way of assembling a bundle is called clutching construction. The name comes from the idea that you take two trivial pieces over each hemisphere, then clutch them together along the equator. The map that performs the gluing is the clutching map. It tells you exactly how two halves are attached along their shared common boundary. Different clutching maps can produce very different total spaces. Because an oriented rank 4 real bundle, M, H, and J to S4 has a structure group SO4. We need to look at maps from 3 sphere into the rotation group SO4. By the way, this S3 has nothing to do with the fiber S3, but transition map of taking 4 sphere as the product of clutching construction. So when exactly is n of h and j topologically seen as 7 sphere? Watch the water climb out the towers and notice how the sublevel changes. Those green points are the critical points of the height function. They mark the moments where the shape changes. The number of type of these points reveal the topology of the manifold.
smooth functions over a smooth manifold like this, whose critical points are all non-degenerative, are called Morse functions. Furthermore, Reeves' theorem tells us if a manifold admits a Morse function with exactly two critical points, one minimum and one maximum, then the manifold must be a topologically sphere. Remember the collection construction? To understand the collection function, we we'll look at the four sphere using these two stereographic charts. Each charge comes from projecting away from one pole. On a region where they overlap, the point has two different coordinate descriptions. You can see the transition map geometrically. Take a point Q on the sphere, project it from the North Pole down to the equatorial plane, and you get one coordinate for Q. Project it from the South Pole, and you get another coordinate. The rule that converts the North projection into the South projection is a diffeomorphism. So when we build the manifold N of H and J, we glue two copies of D4 cross S3 together using this map. A point with coordinate u v on one side is matched with u prime v prime on another side according to two rules. First, by elementary geometry, the base coordinate u becomes u prime equals u divided by the square of it is norm. Second, the fiber coordinate v gets twisted by quaternion multiplication. u prime equals u to the power of h times v times u to the power of j. For these values of h and j, the gluing rule fits together smoothly enough that we can actually build a Morse function on the whole space M of H and J that is defined separately on the North copy and the South copy, and two formulas agree perfectly on the lower lab. It has exactly two critical points, if and only if H plus J equals negative 1. So when that condition holds, M of H and J is a topologically a same sphere. Homotopy groups are usually hard to compute, but luckily we know that S3 cross S3 is a double cover of SO4. This means a loop in S3 cross S3 corresponds to twice a loop in SO4. So the third homotopy group of SO4 is isomorphic to Z plus Z. In other words, each bundle is indexed by a pair of integers, our H and J. Based on this information, we can now compute certain topological quantities that are uniquely determined by the bundle named characteristic classes. For example, the Euler class of a Kasai depends on 1 minus h plus j, and the Pantriagin class depends on 2 times h minus j. But these invariants are not enough to distinguish smooth structures. To go further, we need to bring the Heersberg signature theorem. For any smooth, closed, oriented 8-dimensional manifold, the signature equals 1 over 45 times second Pantriagin class minus squared first Pantriagin class. This gives us a powerful invariant of smooth structures in dimension 8. Neuner then introduced a new invariant called lambda of n for any bounding manifold B, define Q of B as P1 squared and sigma of b as in its signature. Lambda of m is double q minus sigma, modulo 7. Take two different eight-dimensional manifolds, b1, b2, with boundary m, and glue them together along m. The signature theorem applied to these closed manifolds shows that a certain combination of Van Triagin class and the signature depends only on n. If lambda is 0, m of h and j could diffeomorphic to a 7 sphere. But if it's not, then m has a totally different class of smooth structures. Think of lambda like the thread on a light bulb socket, and E27 socket only fits E27 bulbs. There's no way you can screw in an E14 or a B22 bulb. In 2022, Niles Johnson did the first visualization of the exotic seven spheres. His work built on the results by Palais and Serp, which showed diffeomorphisms and embedding are deeply connected. Roughly speaking, if you can wiggle a submanifold, then you can extend that wiggle 
to the entire space. The key idea is the inclusion of F3 inside S7. By restricting the morphism of F3 down to circles, you can track how the seven sphere is glued together. He also developed a way to display hop fibers stacked into tubes. Tracing these tubes reveals the difference between the exotic cousins of standard S7 and itself in a heuristic way. Now, let me show you my remake using Niles method. It took me two weeks to work it out from scratch. The next major breakthrough of exotic structure is in 1963, when Muner and Kavir classified all exotic spheres in dimension 7, a total of 28. In fact, in Beyond Dimension 4, the monoid of exotic structures actually forms a group. In 1982, Michael Friedman proved the existence of exotic R4, along with his work on the topological four-dimensional Punkai conjecture, earning him the Fields Medal in 1986. And we all know that in 2023, Grigory Perelman solved the origin Punkai conjecture after a century of work. And to this day, the question of whether the fourth sphere admits an exotic structure is still open.